During the reign of Constantine VII and extending into the reign of Romanus II, what we see is that the Focates rose to pretty much every senior military command in the empire. First, we have Bardas Phocas taking over as domestics of the east. He retired and was replaced by his son Nicephorus. Leo Phocas, another son of Bardas, was prominent. And we also had John Zemiskis, the nephew of Nicephorus and Leo. However, there was one prominent general who emerged during the reign of Constantine VII who was not a member of the greater Focates group, and that man was Marianos Arguros. Arguros is someone who did not owe his rise to kinship to any man named Phocas, but as we'll see, he was quite close with both Romanus I Lycopinus and with Constantine VII. In this video, I'd like to explore what we know of his career, and we'll see that he is one of the best and most successful political intriguers in all of Byzantine history. When we first meet Arguros in the pages of history, he rises to prominence as a confidant of Romanus I Lycopinus, who famously mostly associated with monks. However, it's clear that Arguros was not your traditional monk. He was from one of the most prominent families in the Byzantine Empire. Because of our lack of information about his biography, we don't really know anything about his early life, how he came to be a monk, or even approximately how old he was. What we do know is that his family was part of the military aristocracy. It was around 100 years old at that time in terms of its uh, place in the establishment. The Arguros family rose to prominence around the mid 9th century. So by the time of the disturbance that led to the elevation of Constantine VII, this family would have been one of the more prominent clans in Byzantine military affairs for around a century. We don't know, as I said, how Arguros came to be a monk, but I think that there's quite a bit of circumstantial evidence in terms of how he clearly wanted to get out of being a monk and how he was able to function at such a high level in military and political affairs that this was not something that was his choice. Perhaps some relative forced him to join the church, or maybe he was in some way implicated in some plot or other, or his father had been, and he had been forced into the service of the church as a punishment. At any rate, it is not known, and because of the state of our evidence, it is completely unknowable. What we do know is that Arguros was well-educated, and he was clearly trained for war and politics. Despite being a close confidant of Romanus I, in late 944, when Stephen and Constantine Lycopinus challenged their father and deposed him from the throne, Arguros sided with the two sons. Later, in early 945, when Constantine VII finally moved against his two competitors, Arguros shifted his loyalty to Constantine and may have played a part in helping Constantine win the throne. It's not clear exactly what, if anything, Arguros did during this time, but it does seem like he must have done something of importance since Constantine uh, made an effort to reward him. Arguros was released of his vows as a monk, and he was able to enter the imperial service as an officer. It would be some years before he would emerge as a senior commander, but when he did, he would be invested with quite a handsome command. On most fronts during the 10th century, Byzantine forces were on the offensive and they were gaining ground. One exception to this was in Italy, where Arab forces were on the march and where the Byzantines had been losing ground for some time. Sicily had fallen and was now a springboard for further advances into Byzantine South Italy. Constantine VII in 956 decided that he needed to staunch the bleeding and he sent Marianos Arguros to Italy with an army and a fleet equipped with Greek fire. Arguros, uniquely, would serve as strategos of both themes in Italy, Longobardia and Calabria. His task was to capture the city of Naples, suppress a Lombard revolt, and fend off more Islamic aggression from Sicily. 
by the way, this combination of powers, i.e. being the Stratagos of both themes, is something that would set a precedent going forward in both Italy and elsewhere. Following this sort of idea of having a commander-in-chief on each front that mimicked the East, where you had the Domesticus of the East, we would also see that a new office of Domesticus of the West would emerge for the Balkan theater. And you could say, I think fairly, that Marianos was something of a pioneer in this regard. However, when we're going into this campaign, one thing to remember is that the precise chronology and sequence of events is difficult to establish, but most likely all of the things we're about to talk about took place between 956 and 957. As I mentioned, this campaign's chronology is unclear, and if I had to provide a label for this campaign, I would call it simply the Confusing Campaign. We do know that our Guros did at some time initiate and successfully complete a siege of Naples, although we do not know when he did this. Did he march on Naples early, or did he wait until hostilities with the Arabs had ceased before he concentrated his forces and marched north? At any rate, he did achieve one of the major objectives of his expedition, and because he took such a major urban center, I think it's safe to say that this event by itself more or less makes his campaign a success. If the dichotomy that our sources present is accurate, then it looks like most of the fighting in 956 was on the sea, and most of the fighting in 957 was on land. If we follow Theophanes the Continuator in a very literal sense, it would appear that the Byzantines won a crushing naval victory that broke the will of the Emir of Africa. However, there is no corroborating evidence, and certainly such a crushing victory would have left some greater resonance on the historical record. Since most Byzantine naval victories, which involved Greek fire and massive losses to the enemy, usually came with some sort of uh, description, or at least encomium. There's also a note in one of the sources that Arguros suffered a major land defeat in Calabria in 957. This could have been against either raiders from Sicily or even from the Lombard rebels that he was tasked with putting down. However, while one of our sources suggests that this naval victory was the reason why the war ended, it's much more likely that the war ended due to negotiations between the Fatimids and Constantine VII. Before this, Constantine VII had been trying to relieve pressure on Italy by forming an alliance with Al-Andalus. Al-Andalus, for their part, was willing to work with the Byzantines because they were trying to wrest land in North Africa away from the Fatimids. When the Fatimids learned that the Byzantines and Al-Andalus were working together, they decided that it would be worth their time and effort to make a treatise, uh, make an armistice with the Byzantines in order to pursue uh, the defense of their homeland. So the Fatimids made peace, and then Constantine, uh, for his end of the deal, decided not to intervene in this larger Islamic conflict and kept Byzantium out of it. We don't know when our Guros returned from Italy but we know that he must have been back by 961. Presumably he was not back in 960 because at that time Leo Phocas was the newly appointed Domesticus of the West and he had won a victory over Magyar raiders. At this time, the Byzantine Empire was being attacked by its neighbors since it had taken a large percentage of its field forces from around the empire to build up the expedition that went with Nicephorus Phocas to conquer Crete. So Byzantium's overland enemies were trying to exploit this period of weakness to gain some plunder. At the same time that the Magyars had tried to attack, Saif al dawla one of the oldest and most inveterate enemies of the Byzantine Empire, had attacked in the east, so Leo Phocas was sent to deal with them as well. Around this time, Arguros seems to have arrived in Europe, maybe he was already there, and at that time he was appointed to fill in for Leo as Monostratagos, or basically single general or commander-in-chief of the Balkans. In this capacity as substitute general, 
Mariano Sarguros was able to defeat a second Magyar raid, taking many prisoners in the process. The implication is that this second defeat was even greater than the first defeat that Leo laid upon the Magyars. We don't hear of any further Magyar incursions for some time. From the 18 years since he had helped Constantine VII take power in 945, Marianos Arguros had enjoyed the good graces of the ruling dynasty. However, in 963, the premature death of Romanus II threw into confusion Marianos's continued status within the empire. Romanus II was only 25 when he died, and we can imagine that for Arguros, who was clearly older than 25, he had fully expected to serve out the remainder of his career under Romanus II and then retire, perhaps passing on his military prestige to a son the way that Bardos Phokas had done with his two sons. But all of that was thrown out the window in early 963 when Romanus II died. Romanus II had two young sons, Basil I and Constantine VIII. Both of them were under five years old at this time and thus would require an extended period of regency. While they did have a living mother, Theophano, who was the reigning empress, she was not someone who was all that well connected within the Byzantine aristocracy. She actually was a peasant stock, and she was not really equipped to govern in her own right. Also keep in mind that this was a period during which uh, it was very difficult for women to govern in any capacity, even when they were well-educated aristocratic women. So what this meant is that there was an opening at the top for someone to serve as a new Romanus Lycopinus, someone to come along and act as a guardian for a child emperor and possibly then stealthily establish their own dynasty. And into this void, the obvious and prohibitive favorite was Nicephorus Phocas. He was an empire-wide hero following his conquest of Crete and he was the obvious choice to be the guardian of the two boy emperors. However, he was not the only person with his eye on the throne. Not to mention that Theophano herself was something of a prize since she was considered to be the most beautiful woman of her generation. So there were plenty of men of high rank who probably envied this position. The person who ended up raising his objection to Nicephorus Phocas, however, was someone who couldn't possibly take control of the throne, and that is the eunuch Joseph Bringas. He was determined, for reasons that are not entirely clear, to prevent Phocas from taking the throne, and he turned to none other than Marianos Arguros for help. For the sake of brevity, let's skip over the breakdown of relations between Nicephorus and Bringas and just get to Bringas looking for an alternative to Nicephorus. Bringas was looking for someone who could offset the claim of Nicephorus. Nicephorus by this point was aiming to become the reigning emperor who would serve until the two boys came of age. And Bringas, who feared for his own position as the head of the civil government, was looking for someone he would find more palatable. The only real option, the only person who could potentially both offset the prestige of Nicephorus and fill the obligations that would be expected of someone at that level of the imperial throne, was none other than Marianos Arguros. He was literally the only viable alternative to Nicephorus. He had military prestige in his own right from Italy and then from dealing with the Magyar raid. Importantly, if not critically, he was one of the few senior commanders who was not a member of the extended Phocas family. And he also happened to be a current commander of a major and nearby army in the form of the Army of the Balkans. Arguros responded to Bringas' appeal to use his army to block the Hellespont and thus prevented Nicephorus from landing unopposed and simply marching into the city and negotiating his way to the throne without a fight. Presumably in the event that they were victorious and they prevented Nicephorus Phocas from claiming the throne, 
Arguros would either become one of the key players in the Council of Regency, if not the key player, or he would simply marry Theophano and take the throne in his own right. So I think that there's every reason to believe that were this plot to succeed, that Arguros would become the real player rather than Bringas, since of course being emperor was always more prestigious than just being the head of the civil government. And because of that, I think that we could even consider naming Arguros as the primary actor in the anti nicephorus Focas movement rather than Bringas, since it was Arguros who stood to gain the most from this movement and not Bringas. Unfortunately for Arguros and his ally Bringas, their approach to politics at this time was not terribly popular. Bringas, as a senior official who was responsible for raising taxes, and as a eunuch, someone from a class of people who were almost always distrusted unfairly, was not someone who inspired a lot of confidence from the public. As for Marianos Arguros, he did have some prestige and popularity, but he wasn't nearly on the same level as Nicephorus Phocas, who was fresh off of conquering Crete, the source of much of the woe that the inhabitants of the Aegean had endured for the last century and a half. So it wasn't really a fair contest when it comes to winning over the hearts and minds of the people. Arguros seems to have taken up the mantle of leadership for the anti focos cause when he arrived in the capital. This could be both because, as we've observed, he was more popular than Bringas, and because he would become the new face of the administration were they actually to succeed. He wrote a letter to John Zemiskis urging him to turn on his uncle, but Zemiskis remained loyal and then showed the letter to his uncle. It may have been this letter which alerted Nicephorus to the seriousness of his enemy's preparations and made him declare himself emperor. This shows me a couple of different things. One is that perhaps Arguros knew that Zemiskis was someone who had some self-serving tendencies and that he might be willing to turn on his uncle. For those of you who know what happened to Nicephorus in the end, you might think that Arguros, maybe the arch plotter, saw something in Zemiskis that all of their contemporaries missed. As for the letter making Nicephorus declare himself emperor, what this shows me is that Nicephorus must have interpreted Arguros's actions as Arguros having his own ambitions for the throne. So by declaring himself emperor, Nicephorus was staking out a position and making sure that if Arguros was able to move on Theophano before he got to Constantinople, that he would not be able to be labeled a usurper. So that is my interpretation of both what Arguros was trying to do and Nicephorus's reaction to it. When it became apparent that John Zemiskis would not deliver Arguros the throne by slitting his uncle's throat, Arguros had to resort to desperate measures in order to try to fend off Nicephorus. Facing both the threat of Nicephorus's forces and a hostile population in the city, Arguros had little choice but to free and arm Arab POWs in order to bolster his ranks and keep order in the city. One of the problems in the city was that the elderly father of Nicephorus, Bardas Phocas, had taken refuge in the Hagia Sophia and refused to leave. Bringas had ridden up to the great cathedral and tried to remove and arrest Bardas but hadn't succeeded, and Arguros was determined to succeed where his ally had failed, so he came with armed men, but the crowd resisted. And part of this resistance was that women from nearby rooftops, as was often the case in ancient and medieval street battles, were throwing things. One woman from a nearby rooftop threw a plate which hit Arguros on the head on August 15th. He was knocked out and had to be carried off the scene. The next day, he died from this head injury. Arguros's death was the end of the resistance to Nicephorus's entry, and after that, he had a very smooth path to power. Bringas could do little, and his career was effectively ended, since after what had happened, Nicephorus had 
no real interest in retaining his services. Marianos Arguros is virtually unique in that he was someone who was able to escape his monastic vows to pursue a career in politics. Out of all of the generals of the 10th century who were not members of the extended Phocas clan, at least in terms of the time period we're talking about in this video, he was by far the most successful and prominent of these non Phocades generals. The only rival that he has is Basileos Hexamilites, and he's only known for winning one battle, whereas Arguros commanded on two different fronts in Italy and the Balkans, in both cases in the capacity of commander-in-chief, and in both cases more or less successfully. His role in the succession struggle of 963 is, in my estimation, massively underestimated by most scholars. And the reason why they underestimate it is because he was aligned with the much more well-attested Joseph Bringas. However, as I've noted many times, eunuchs were universally despised by our sources, and our sources tend to see eunuchs as the basically plotting machines who were designed to undermine all that was good in the world. Therefore, the blame in their mind would go to Bringas, who was pulling off all of these schemes. In reality, though, we know that Arguros was quite an accomplished schemer in his own right, and that he would have benefited much more than the eunuch Bringas. So I would argue that there is every reason to believe that it was Arguros and not Bringas who was the primary mover of the anti focas movement of 963. So what if Marianos Arguros had succeeded in winning the regency and then the throne rather than Nicephorus Phocas. Well, he's a much more adept politician, so I imagine that his reign would not have ended due to murder at the hands of his own nephew. That being said, I have no reason to believe that Arguros was anywhere nearly as talented as Nicephorus Phocas when it came to military matters. So most likely Byzantine arms would not have done as well under his direction as they did under that of the hero of Crete. At any rate, I think that might be a good topic for an alternative history scenario, what would have happened if Arguros had won. That might be something I am considering doing, and if I do it, it will be a Patreon-only affair. I'll keep you posted. But until then, I'm Thersites the Historian, and we will cover more Byzantine stuff when we come back to talk about the career of Nicephorus II Phocas.